Hello. Welcome back to Aloha at Home. Thank you guys for joining me. My name is Jamie Torkowski, and I'm the founder of To Write Love on Our Arms. Honored to get to be here with you once again. I am here on behalf of our team, on behalf of the To Write Love on Our Arms staff and our interns. We are working from home, spread out in a bunch of states, a lot of, a lot of people in Florida, but spread out all over. I am in East Nashville, Tennessee. Always give a shout out to Ruthie from our team who is holding down the warehouse and shipping out online store orders, which we are grateful to her and we are grateful to you when you order stuff from our store and allow us to keep going. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here once again today. We've got two awesome guests, Kate Fagan and Tanya Ingram. Before I bring on my friend Kate, got a couple announcements for you. So want to acknowledge that our friend Chris Hewitt's his new podcast episode with us. So his new episode of the To Write Love on Our Arms podcast comes out today. It's called Making Room for Grief, Gratitude, and Mindfulness. And you can find that in or on our Fear Won't Win landing page. So that's something we've been pointing to a whole bunch. If you come to our website, twaloha.com, uh, click on the words Fear Won't Win, and that is a landing page that we keep adding to uh, primarily just tools and solutions related to self-care, related to encouragement in this time, blog posts, podcast episodes. So we're excited to share Chris's new episode. It's a conversation uh, that he had, and he's also a member of our board of directors and just a, an incredible voice of wisdom, someone that we're really grateful to have in our corner. So check that out. Thursday, two days from now, April 30th, we are doing another Twiloha at home. This one will be happening over on Facebook. And this is something different. I will not be hosting it. Chad Moses and Elizabeth Wilder from our team will be hosting this one. And this is an alcohol-free virtual happy hour with Jesse Hawkins from The Mocktail Project. And he will be teaching you to make a pina conata. Not a pina colada, but a pina conata. And if you go to our events page, you can find the ingredients. So if you just want to watch, that's fine. But if you want to learn how to make one and to follow along and make one as Jesse makes one, you can find all the ingredients over on our events page. So again, that's this Thursday, same time, 4 p.m. Eastern. Jesse Hawkins from The Mocktail Project will be leading us in an alcohol-free virtual happy hour. And more importantly, more than just making a drink, talking about sobriety in this time, in this difficult, strange season that we find ourselves in, what does sobriety look like? And so Chad and Elizabeth from our team will be hosting that conversation May, as you may know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And once again, we will be offering a black and white collection of merch that has become a tradition over the last few years. And so we're actually going to be launching that on Thursday. In addition to the special merch, there will be new blog posts. There will be new podcast episodes. So we are excited to embrace the month of May and Mental Health Awareness Month and we'll actually be launching these things a day early. So also on Thursday, April 30th, this Thursday. And last but not least, Giving Tuesday Now is something new that's happening one week from today, May 5th, Tuesday, May 5th. Uh, it is something that we are honored and excited and grateful to be able to participate in. We are one among thousands of nonprofits that need help in this time. Like so many businesses, we need help navigating this time so that we can continue to do what we do, to continue to bring hope, encouragement, resources to people, not only across the US, but around the world. And we also love being able to fund treatment. We love being able to fund professional help and we need 
your support to make that happen. So we're in the middle of a fundraising campaign for our Run For It 5K, which is coming up Saturday, May 16th. We are over halfway to that goal of raising $85,000. Find more about that, runforit5k.com. You can participate, you can run, walk. I always say push a stroller, push a wheelchair. It's not about being the fastest runner. We are just inviting people to move for something that matters. So again, runforit5k.com. And then we would love your support, whether it's now or next Tuesday for Giving Tuesday now, again, May 5th, a week from today. And anytime you want to make a gift to the organization, even if it's just a one-time gift, twaloha.com slash donate is the place to do that. And I will now bring on my friend, Kate Fagan. She is the author of this book, she is the New York Times bestselling author of the book, What Made Maddie Run? The Secret Struggles and Tragic Death of an All-American Teen. So a book that touches on mental health, specifically depression, suicide, and uh, it'll be great to, to catch up with Kate. And she's been telling stories for years. When we, when we got to know her not long ago, she was at ESPN, and she has has since moved on, transitioned out of her time at ESPN. But I know is continue or is excited to continue not only to tell stories, but I think with with this example to tell stories that relate to mental health as well. So with that, I will bring on Kate Fagan, who will be joining us from Charleston, South Carolina. She's hi. What's up? Hi. Oh, that's too low. How are you? I have you look, to say, I have to say that that people kept saying that you have kind eyes in the comments, and you really do have very kind eyes. <laughs> well, thank you. You yes. I, you have cooler hair than me, so I have to work with what I have. You know. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You have kind hair. <laughs> what are these headphones? They're amazing. Oh, thanks for noticing. I think it's the first time I've I've used them. They're like a Beats fashion headphone and you have these little beads and you can make them yourself you can do whatever colors you want and so i was well, like hey these are stylish i'll wear these we're in the middle of a skull candy partnership so i can't i can't highlight that too much but they do look awesome yeah i i don't have a beats partnership so we can trash them if we need okay. to. <laughs> so um how are you where are you i already gave it away but yeah um we're down in charleston I know you're you, in Nashville um, and Charles, you, it's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful you city. You and your wife. Yes. Catherine, my wife, who I, I told her she has that. There she is. She's on yeah. right now. So Is she um, in another yeah. room? No, she's just listening with headphones across from me. <laughs> That's awesome. She holds up like keywords and ideas. Yeah, I don't know what to say. She just holds up like like SNL cue cards for me. No way. You're, you're a pro. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you so much for, for being with us. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. It's always important to me to stay connected to you guys. Oh, you're the best. I know every time I think to to send you shirts, you remind me that you've you've recently ordered some because yeah. you're just awesome. And because they're, they're awesome. And I, yeah. I, I probably wear them three to five times a week. I wear your guys' shirts. They're comfortable. They're stylish. They have an important message. They're, they're awesome. Oh, you're the best. Um, it's a tough transition, but I know obviously everyone is in a difficult, unusual season, but I know, um, you shared with me earlier, you lost your dad back in December to ALS and we touched on it, but I'd love to talk here. I think it's important. I've, I've been having a lot of these conversations and it's felt significant. Uh, a lot of people, it feels like they are only navigating uh, this pandemic and what does life look like in this pandemic? But you obviously represent someone who's been walking through grief and learning what life looks like without your dad. And I just, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that process has been like. Yeah, it's been surprising because I think I had an idea that grief looked like it did in movies and in books and that there was like this chunk of time right after someone you love died where you were in a 
deep version of grief. And that's just not how I've experienced it. Um, for me, it's been more, as many people have said, like more moments here and there where a memory or if I see something or my dad loved birds. So if like I see a cool bird, I might, I might just start crying, but that doesn't mean that I then like the whole day is a sad day for me. It's just a moment where I'm remembering him, but I might not even feel like it's not a full, um, you know, like three, four month kind of wallowing period. So it, it's been, it's, that's what's been interesting to me about it is that there is no set, pattern or path and sometimes I think maybe I'm not grieving enough because it doesn't look like I think it should look but all I can do because a lot of times when I think about them it's really happy and they're they're awesome memories and so I've been kind of working through that wondering if like am I doing it right um is this am I missing something is this going to come back in a year or two and I'm just going to break down because I haven't processed it. You know, all those things that we, we talk about, you know, it's like you can't just hold things inside. So I've just kind of been letting it be what it needs to be. Um, and the, and everything happening with the pandemic hasn't shifted that too much, except just kept me away from, I had planned to spend a lot more time with my mom who lives in New York uh, upstate New York. And now I just, you know, it's like, it's been two months since I've seen her. And so that part is hard, but otherwise like we've been really lucky during this pandemic with, you know, where we live and the resources we have. And so we've been trying to see the silver linings because we're in the position where we can do that. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, are there certain things that have been helpful, whether it's specifically in this time or kind of related to, navigating grief i know you mentioned kind of not having it all figured out but i it's felt important to ask every guest just are there any rhythms or tools or uh just things you've been leaning into that have felt good in this in this time yeah i think there's the usual slate of things that i've tried to do which is that i think so many people are saying right move my body every day you know I have a Peloton, we could talk about that for an hour, right? <laughs> but um, the biggest difference I think for me and my wife during this time has been really committing to get back into books. Mm. And that has been a huge, not just solace feels like too negative a word. It's been a huge joy for us during this time period because I think I remember you know, moments when you fall in love with a book, it feels like the idea that you could ever be bored just goes out the window and you could be doing other things. And in your mind, you're like, I can't wait to get back to that book. Yeah, yeah. And I think I've let that go over the last five years. You know, I'll yeah. go for months without even having a book that I'm supposedly True. reading. And so that's been a huge key for us is like, get like, I, I, um, I always have a book now during the pandemic because I don't want, to be, I don't want to waste two hours scrolling through things and I don't, you know, whatever waste means, but I, I want to have that, like that comfort and that joy of knowing I can go into that someone's story. So that's really, for me, been a huge benefit of this time period and helped me tremendously. Everything behind you, those are the books you're reading right now. No, these are cookbooks. Um, and by the way, I, this is my picture of Zidane, and I started to think that you looked like Zidane. He's a soccer player. I noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I noticed him. He uh, He's a famous French soccer pa player, and I was like, oh, my God, Jamie kind of looks like Zidane. Um, but no, those are cookbooks. I My wife reads those and then makes things for us. <laughs> That's awesome. I've been asking everyone if they've read Glennon's new book, Untamed. So oh. have you? Yes. I'm in the middle of it, and I relate because I <laughs> haven't been reading enough in the last couple of years and i've been loving her book so much lately yeah we um we both read it um like the week it came out and yeah. you know i like i i don't know about you i like i picked it up so i wanted to hear about like her love story with abby um yeah. and then i kind of got blown away by all of the other really insightful oh, tidbits totally. in it so yeah. yeah it was awesome shout out glennon yes yeah, um, <laughs> speaking of of books i want to I want to go back. I wonder, um, and I know you've been asked this, and I, I bet we've, uh, we've probably even touched on it, but just was mental health already on your radar in a major way? Did you learn a lot 
writing what made Maddie run. Um, and I wonder just, yeah, just a little bit of kind of what that process was like for you. No, I mean, that's a, that's a good question because I think I almost carry, I don't know if shame is the right word, but guilt over the fact that like before I started working on that project, I didn't, mental health was not something that I like thought about a lot. I didn't, I certainly had moments in my life where I struggled, but like just didn't have the language or the community to understand what was happening or the words I should use to describe it. Um, and so when I first started reporting uh, Maddie's story and just for, you know, for viewers, listeners here who don't know, it's a, it's a story about a young student athlete who dies by suicide at the university of Pennsylvania. And she's a student athlete. Um, you know, she was like a state champion in high school. She was kind of the traditional quote unquote, all American kid. And so when I first started reporting her story, I, I really was driven by just simple journalistic curiosity. You know, there were, the headlines around her death, like just didn't seem to capture the complexity of it. And so I didn't even know that I was getting into a story that would take me to places where I'd have to really start to contemplate what's happening among our youth in terms of anxiety, depression, and suicidal thought. I really was driven by, um, I, want the, I want the answer to these questions. Mm -hmm. And from there, I started to realize how much deeper and more important and vital her story was as a story that was emblematic in a lot of ways, of like what was happening with the younger generation. Mm. Yeah. And does that, did it impact maybe the kinds of stories you hope to tell in the future? I know a book is a giant commitment, but I wonder, yeah. I wonder kind of what you make of that. Yeah, it, it did because, um, you know, like I left ESPN last year and I would say before I started working on Maddie's story, I like, I, I wanted to do more meaningful sports stories, but I had no idea that I could do a sports story that really wasn't a sports story mm. and that could transcend really athletics really in any, any way at all and be a completely human story with ram with different ramifications that I, not ramifications, but uh, a result that I felt like was powerful for kids, regardless of whether they were athletes or not. And so once I, once I, you know, once I told that story about Maddie, I started to feel like I almost couldn't go back to like predicting the NFC East results. You know, it was almost like, oh no, there's like really meaningful work I could be doing. And it almost soured me on like the day-to-day, -day, what, what I think is more like fun, trivial, trivia part of ESPN. I was like, no, 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 I gotta, I gotta find all of these meaningful stories and I want to work on this meaningful stuff over here. So that was definitely a part of it. Yeah. I yeah. wonder before we get to kind of what you're working on now and next, um, I know it's hard to sum things up, but, but if there were one or two things you feel like you, you learned in the process of writing what made Maddie run um, related to mental health, I wonder what one or two of those might be. Yeah. Um, one is so excruciatingly obvious and that but i didn't realize it before i started working on the book and that and that one thing the first thing was that everybody's brain works differently mm. and really until working on that book i think i just like had this assumption that like you know everybody kind of woke up some days were good some days were bad and you know, I knew everybody thought about things differently, but I didn't know that just the, the brain could make somebody feel differently than I felt on a day to day basis. And when I start once that book came out, you know, I had a lot of like friends, people in my life who I was pretty close with. I didn't even know that they struggled to get out of bed on certain days and that they had suicidal thoughts that they had dealt with at various points during their life. And mm. it was it was really you know, excruciatingly simple, but profound for me to, to recognize that, that simple fact. Um, and, and to really like, for the first time, consider the fact that because I most of the time wake up and I'm like, cool, you know, good. I feel good that that it was a privilege yeah. and not what everyone else necessarily felt each time they woke up. And that was yeah. pretty, um, 
that was pretty significant for me. And then um, the other was actually more of like an umbrella understanding. Until I started working on Maddie's story, I was really ignorant to the rates of anxiety and depression and suicidal thought and suicide among young people. Mm. Um, I just, I don't know, it, it, you know, it was five years ago and I think we've learned a lot uh, and I think we've become as a population more aware of what's happening, but I was really just blind to it. Yeah. Um, I just thought, Oh, everything, you know, every generation probably feels the same. Um, and so that, that too shifted how I thought, because then I wanted to figure out like, as best I could understand, like why are kids feeling sure. so much differently than previous generations? So that kind of opened a door too. Yeah. I want to yeah. invite the viewers. We, we love, taking questions from you guys. So not just questions that I come up with, but we want to hear from you. Uh, we've got a couple in there now, but there's a little question mark icon at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question for Kate uh, about her life, her work, uh, what made Maddie run, the book that she wrote, uh, we would love to get to a couple of your questions. I wonder, Kate, for you, I imagine so many people wanted to share their stories or parts of their story with you uh, in response to the book. And I wonder what was that like? Was it too much or overwhelming at times? Um, you're, you're, you're definitely right in that. Um, my inbox, my email up until probably the, up until the pandemic really. Cause I think, I, I don't think, you know, what made Maddie run isn't a book I would want to read during a pandemic, you know? Sure. So um, up until then, I, I would be getting emails all the time from usually kids, most often kids, you know, high schoolers, college kids, some athletes, some not, who who really felt uh, a kinship to Maddie, mm. and but in a but in a positive way, in that they were like they were through mm. a, a bout that they had had a struggle, but they felt so similar to Maddie, and oftentimes it, they would reach out with you know, a document attached that might be a five page story they'd written just laying out how they had felt. Um, and I think that becomes really challenging just because you can see how someone's pouring out their heart to reach out to you and to yeah. be able to reciprocate in kind is impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if it's every couple of days you're getting one. Um, so what became challenging was not reading those stories because I would try to I would tr always try to read them and just say, please know that I read this. Yeah. Even if I can't reciprocate with the same energy that you've put into this sure. email. So reading their stories wasn't the hard part. The hard part was feeling like I had failed in some way mm. in my response to them. Yeah. Because you, you never know what the expectations are or the hopes of connection in those moments. And so that that always felt like a struggle because I didn't want to disappoint people. Sorry. Disappoint okay. people who had connected with the book. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I relate to that. I, I think it, it was a process for me, but I sort of have come up with the language of believing that people deserve better than what I can offer in response a lot of the time. Mm. Um, so it's not about me being busy or important but I think trying to redirect and say, hey, your story matters and you deserve people in your own community and your own support system um, that will feel the weight and celebrate you and your life and your recovery. And, and certainly you deserve whatever professional help you might need. But I feel like it, it took me a bunch of years to kind of begin to think that way where like we might be able to have a moment or an email exchange, but but wanting people to have kind of as you touched on, like the response they deserve, even if it can't come from you. I don't know if that yeah. makes sense. No, it, it it does make sense, and it's almost. I mean, it almost feels self centered that I think I should be the one, you know, to. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. Well, they, you know, they you feel like you, right? Like yeah, you right. to you, yeah. Right, but you know that you, yeah. No, I think that's a really smart way to look at it because I do still feel kind of like guilt when I can't respond the way that I would hope to be responded to. Sure. Sure. Um, you mentioned having maybe a question for me. Yeah, I wanted to know kind of how you guys have seen at To Write Love on Our Arms, like how have you seen this pandemic affecting people? Hmm. I think I think we see, I mean, first off, I think we try to acknowledge that 
for some people, they're only dealing with anxiety. They're only dealing with uncertainty and fear, but other people are also dealing with basic needs, right? They're out of work. Uh, they don't know how long they might be out of work. They're trying to figure out how to pay rent or how to buy groceries. So I think we always want to acknowledge that there's sort of the narrative that we're all at home, but obviously some people are not, right? Some people work at hospitals and grocery stores, but I think we're seeing and hearing a lot about anxiety, probably more than anything else. I think we've tried to point out that for a lot of folks who follow us, life was already hard. You know, life was hard six, six eight, ten weeks ago, and it just feels harder in this time of uncertainty, in this time when it makes sense that pretty much everyone has dealt with fear. And um, it's only going to be harder if, if you can't make money, right? Like if you can't, um, if your basic needs are, are up in the air. So uh, I know we've heard from our friends at Crisis Text Line that they're, they're staying incredibly busy. But I think I'd, I'd probably put anxiety at the top of the list in, ter in terms of a, a word or an issue that, that we're hearing the most about. Um, and I think that's why it's, it's felt really important to do stuff. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> hey, everyone should get a dog. Wait, do you guys have a dog? Yeah, we, we have two dogs. They're just not on the, they're just not in the spot. They're not like, they're not cuddlers, so I'd have to go find them. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Um, no, but I think just, I think also just pe a lot of people talking about loneliness um, and so it's felt important even to use these Instagram lives as an example of, hey, so many things are limited, so many things are canceled, but we still need relationships, we still need friends and conversations, and how can we use technology, how can we have phone calls and FaceTimes, um, so how can we relationally get what we need, but also pointing to professional help in the same way, and, you know, telehealth is sort of an odd buzzword but just the idea that you can still get professional help in this time it may look or feel different but i can still go to counseling i can i can do counseling through a phone call or through a skype um so i think that that loneliness is a real thing for a lot of people and it and it feels important to acknowledge that that makes sense that so many people are in that boat but also that let's use the tools we have to try to to try to um, reach out and connect yeah. in whatever ways we can. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the update. I always think about you guys. <laughs> oh, that's totally cool. Let me, let me get to a, a question from somebody else. Oh, wait, let me see. Okay. This is a, a really honest one and I hope this is okay. Have you dealt with guilt yes. as part of your grief? Wow, now I um that felt like a good technology. You just swipe that question right into my line of sight. Yeah, I mean, so that's an awesome that's an awesome que question. Um Yeah, I think there's a couple different layers to that. There's just the the guilt around the grief itself, like is it enough? Am I performing it? Is it looking like am I doing it because this is how I've seen other people do it or is this real and authentic? And mm. though, although you'd think that would be really easy to delineate, sometimes you get confused in your own head about like, am I like, what am I performing this right now? Or is sure. this real? And then you're, there's guilt around like all of those feelings. And then there's just the guilt and regret that comes from like, you know, in, in this case, my dad, dying and then all of the guilt and regret you have even if I tried to do everything I could do like I left in some ways that's why I left ESPN I was there all the time but you still you still like there's those moments where you're like oh my god why did I do and say those things um sure. so yeah there, I mean there, there's all those multi-layers of grief that I know you know everyone you know you were human so all of us feel and are dealing with all those things on a daily yeah. basis so many of us um my sister jessica had a question jess i have a feeling it's only going to show us the first half so you might have to help us in the comments but jess said knowing how much basketball meant to you in high school and college and 
ultimate Jess, this is a total cliffhanger. We need you because I can only What read. is Woo Wait. Knowing how much basketball meant to you in high school and college and ultimately shaped your life, what is your advice or encouragement to kids? Jess, we need you if you're out there. It's a total cliffhanger. To kids who we can who we can love make basketball, it up. Who's who cute. love it, who miss it. <laughs> Jess, we need you, but for now we'll do our best. <laughs> or this could be like an awesome like end of first season one of uh, oh, yeah, this yeah, show, yeah. and we'll, we'll be back next week <laughs> with the second half of the question. <laughs> yes, Jess, it cut off. What about basketball and kids? Just any See, advice. See, I thought it was going to be about my dad, but I like, but I then it took a right turn. I'm oh, yeah, it was a total transition. She's probably <laughs> typing away right now. <laughs> Hang on, I'll see if there's another one um, I can get to. Jess, we will. Jess, we'll read yours out of the comments. Um, let's see. Oh, school is canceled. Sports have been canceled. More Ma con. More context. More context. <laughs> Maybe is it just kids that miss sports? And what do you have any advice for them? Kids that maybe miss their team or playing sports with their friends. Yeah, I mean, I, I just got off the phone with my mom before we did this, and she said she saw like a fifth grader just FaceTiming, put it on the, you know, put it on the base of the, of the, the basketball hoop and then just playing together. So of course, like you talk about technology, but I think maybe it's because I played college and pro that I, I always think of questions about sports, like people really dedicated to sports for kids. Yeah. And like most of the, my thoughts around this pandemic now were like, it's probably good for those sixth, seventh, eighth graders who have been like year round doing summer travel and like practicing every day. Like they shouldn't, I don't think they should be doing that to begin with, you know, they should be like doing other things and they need time off. So, because if it's something they love, then they want to be doing it for 10, 15, 20 years. And so I think for some kids, it could be a good way to keep from burning out. And from other for for others, you know, there it's like there, there's some technology workarounds, but you know, it's just got to do hard things sometimes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you think it does? I know not everyone has a hoop or or access, but it it makes a case for if if you have access to a hoop, even the joy of shooting baskets by yourself, right? Oh like, yeah. Kind of the purity, the simplicity of that. Yeah, that I mean that should like. 70% of your if you're a basketball kid that should be like 70% of what you do is shooting by yourself yeah, so yeah. you know I know that circumstances maybe some kids can't do that but you know there you can kick the soccer ball alone in the yeah. house don't you know these are these are wartime rules you know they're different yeah. than peacetime rules <laughs> sure I mean I think it's also it's like it's worth noting I mean I, I I've, I've probably shared with you I read hoops hype every morning still mm -hmm which it's it's probably a bit quieter these days, you know? Than, I would say a little bit, yeah. But um, there's NBA guys that haven't touched a basketball in weeks, you know? So That's like, crazy to me. If there's if those guys aren't shooting, like, then, you know, hopefully kids can realize they're not alone in this. Like, there are so many people who love sports who are away from playing sports right now. Yeah. And, there, like, there's there's just, like, the joy of being young and loving to do something. And I and I hate that kids can't have that right now. But I just I worry about the kids who are like worried it's going to set them back on their you know sure. pursuit of the scholarship. Where you're like, no, no, no. Like th these this break could be so healthy for your mind and body. Yeah. 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 No, that's good. Before we let you go, will you will you tell us what's what's next? What are you what are you working on? What are you excited about? Yeah, I'm I'm really lucky that I'm gonna the same editor that I worked on for the Maddie book, we're, we're going to do a book together um, about my dad. It's going to kind of the way I think of it is like Tuesdays with Maury, but for millennials, you know, just trying to yeah. some life lessons through basketball and through spending time with him at the end. That's the goal. And you're, are you already working on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. I, we were thinking that right now we want it to come out like father's day 2021 so yeah. i want to have it done by like the fall so that's the goal yeah. but i'm like working on it now 
I mean, it's a great time to work on it. You know, I'm just sure. not, not that everybody needs to be working on things, but it's really healthy for me to like try to write every day and feeling like there's like a purpose to the writing. Yeah. yeah. Has that been, I, I imagine it's a mix of heavy and hard and beautiful and like, has that just been a roller coaster? The, the process of remembering and writing these stories? Yeah, it's been for the most part awesome. Cause it's yeah. like, for those two hours every day, I'm kind of living in a memory. Yeah. And you know, you got that magical thinking happening where you kind of forget and you're just back in that moment. Um, and then there are some days where it's still awesome, but I might come back in because I work out back like crying, yeah. but in a good way um, yeah. that I'm lucky enough that I had a dad who I want to write a book about, you yeah. know, like that I'm pretty and lucky. Yeah, what a way to honor him, right? And to yeah. share his life with so many people. Yeah. That's really cool. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for spending this time with us. And uh, it's good to, good to see your face. And It's good and to see you your, too. And hear your voice. Um, yeah. And I, I, I know you've been, you've been kind in inviting me, but I want to get to Charleston yes. eventually to hang out with you guys. We'll take you to the good restaurants that will hope, hopefully remain open after this is all over. Oh, I would love that. Well, hello to Catherine and um, you guys have a great rest of the day. Stay healthy and stay safe. Thanks, Jamie. It's really good to see you now. Am I closing out of this? Yeah, you That's just, it. you close out. I'll X out and you'll be good. All right. Yep. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye guys. So you guys, that is Kate Fagan. Uh, if you don't already follow her, please do. She's wonderful. Again, her book is What Made Maddie Run. And this was a book that had a lot of success, New York Times bestseller. And um, with that, just continued to push the conversation around mental health, around suicide prevention. Um, so Kate's been a big supporter and a great friend to the organization. And so we're grateful for her and proud to know her. And uh, with that, we're gonna bring on Tanya Ingram. So we've, we're gonna go from the East Coast to the West Coast. And Tanya is from New York. Tanya is an incredible spoken word poet, uh, author of a couple books. Her newest one, How to Survive Today. Um, so she, she's from New York, now lives in LA, and we're gonna bring her on now. Oh, Tanya, I see you. Hi. Hi. Wait, did I get your book title right? I'm all, I'm feeling insecure. No, no, How to Survive Today, that's it. Okay, I, you know how like when you know something, but then you don't know if you know it? Yeah. I <laughs> no, did that's that. perfect, that's perfect. Um, <laughs> And when did that come out? That came out in November, November of 2019. You were in a park with birds? Yeah, do you hear all of this? Yeah, that was beautiful. <laughs> um, wait, will you tell us where you are? You don't have I to say like the park, but just... The park. Um, I'm in California in uh, North Hollywood, I guess. Yeah. And... All right, we'll kind of bounce around if that's okay, but are you outside, I'm, I'm projecting, but are you outside because outside has felt good? Oh, could you hear my question? Oh no, did it? Oh, okay, <laughs> yes. You good, can you hear me? Question. I can hear you. Um, yeah. Oh, I don't know if you, I'll ask it again, but are you outside because outside feels good? Yes, I am outside because outside feels peaceful and I feel like I have the most joy by just trying to find some normalcy in all of this wild, yeah. wild change, yeah. So I talked a little bit about your work. We've, um, promoted your books. We've had you at Heavy and Light. I like to tell people you've stole the show at Heavy and Light, which is our annual event. Um, so such a gifted poet, writer. I always am blown away by your vulnerability and your honesty. And we've been having people on, and it's similar to the conversation I just had with Kate, but you're someone who is not only navigating this pandemic. I know that life 
has been hard the last few years and and so i wonder if however much you want to share just kind of what you've been navigating not only in your mental health but your oh. i thought you tipped over i was worried <laughs> i'm so uh, sorry just, no 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 you're someone who lives with a chronic illness is that right that's correct and i wonder if if you could just share a little bit about what you've been walking through yes so i live with or i have lupus which has affected my kidneys and lupus is a chronic illness where the body kind of attacks itself under certain circumstances and i've been diagnosed for about seven years now and it's been very very scary to live with the chronic illness during this time because i'm very very compromised by just yeah. living you know and so it's it's been strange it's been confusing it's been overwhelming it's been stressful and all of those things um like affect my mental health as well and so i'm i'm trying to find the best way to like take care of myself more than i did before this pandemic um because life is different my my livelihood has is more like just at risk and so yeah it's been it's been challenging for sure yeah and you we talked you and i talked earlier kind of about you have to kind of choose your battles or your moments um and kind of assess the risks of going outside or going to pick up a coffee right yeah yeah i i have to calculate things much differently um thankfully i've had a support system to like help with that with like just daily tasks so if i need groceries i have friends who are supportive enough to like just drop them off at my doorstep because me just going getting in a lift and going to the grocery store is like a huge risk for me you know and Yeah. Mm. We're losing you a little bit. It's it's freezing up. Oh. I do want to say while we while we hope for uh for the internet. Um if you guys have questions for Tanya, we'd we'd love to get to a couple of those. Uh, so there's the question mark icon at the bottom of your screen. Tanya, you there? Oh, hello. Can you hear me? We can't. It seems frozen. Uh, okay. We're having a tough time. This this happens, right? Hey. Can you hear me at all? We're having trouble. It's like slow motion. Uh maybe we all right. We're doing our best here, people. That's all anyone can do. Tanya, if you will. Tanya, if you will request to go live. Let's see here. Okay, we're gonna try to get her back on. Gracie's barking at the lawn people. Hey. Hi. I'm so uh, sorry uh, about this. It's okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we, we got you. Yes. Um, all right, you can hear me. I'm trying, do you remember what we were in the middle of? It's still, it's kind of slow motion. It's like super slow-mo. We're having trouble.
Oh, can you hear me, Tanya? All right. You're not near your house. Oh, are you near your house or no? Oh, guys, we're having trouble. We're doing our best. Parks are great, but not great for Wi-Fi. I can't hear you. Oh, my friend, we want to hear you so bad. All right. So I think we might have to bring her back on another time. She is a brilliant woman with lots of good stuff and we wanna to get to her story and, okay, let's try one more time. So we'll give this one more go. We're trying here. If we don't get her now, I promise we'll have Tanya back on soon. Hey. Hey. Can is it still slow motion? You, no, it's it's okay in this moment. Okay. Okay. If, if we lose you again, we'll, we'll. It's it's all right. If we if we end up losing you again, we'll just we'll try again soon. Okay. Yes. Um, from home. Yeah. I think you were talking about. Um, someone mentioned you were talking about having a support system in this time of navigating your, you know, lupus, and I, I think also living in this, living through this pandemic, which we all are. I don't know if that sparks anything. Yes, living with lupus. Yeah, just, just, I think just taking as much precaution as possible, um, which is new for me because I feel well not new actually I've been living with this illness for seven years and so to be living in it now I feel like it feels like it's more severe but it's also really it's overwhelming because I feel like the world has to adjust to a way of living that I've had to since 2013 and so that feels more heavy for me to like know that yeah. like everyone is living like this and I, I sometimes I feel helpless because I'm like ah like I don't know I just I would never want anyone to deal with what I deal with but to see that it's happening in the world has been has been pretty intense for me hmm. are there I asked Kate this I've been trying to ask everyone are are there certain uh, rhythms or just things that you found helpful related to self-care or your mental health in this time Yes, coming to the park, um, I, I've been, I do dialysis, which is a process to help my kidneys function. And so every night I have to plug to a machine and then every morning I have to unplug. Um, and I find that after I do that, I've been taking walks around my neighborhood um, just to get out of my room um, because I feel sometimes suffocated in that, in that space. And so I find walks anytime I'm in the sun, I feel a hundred times better. Um, staying hydrated, which is simple, but like just having yeah. water in my body makes me feel so much better. Um, I love to dance in my mirror by myself with like headphones on. So I've been doing that. I did that for like an hour yesterday in my bed and I felt yeah. very silly, but it brought me so much joy. And I think just the small things, like I play The Sims, which is a computer game for like yeah, five yeah, yeah. hours <laughs> and a lot of TV and trying to not guilt myself for doing any of that. I think that's been the biggest thing. Sure. I'm not writing as much, um, and, but I'm also telling myself that's okay, you know, and finding some sort of a routine that doesn't put that pressure on me. And, um, and I think that's been helpful as much as possible. Talking to my grandmother is a form of self-care She's in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I and I wish I could be with her right now. So just talking to her every day, like that brings me, that's a self-care um, activity for myself as well. Yeah. I was gonna ask about kind of relationships. Obviously we're 
there's distance, there's isolation. For you, what has remaining connected to your loved ones, what has that looked like? It looks like phone calls. It looks like trying to not stress out my family. I'm from New York and uh, all my, my mom and my siblings are there now and they're in the Bronx. Um, and it's been hard because I know things aren't going well in New York and specifically in the Bronx sure. things aren't going well at all. And so trying to text them as much as possible, but there's just that it doesn't feel like it's enough for me, if I'm honest. Like I wish yeah. I was home, but there's no way for me to be there. Um, so I, the best I can do is send my little sister funny memes. The best I can do is call my grandma or like text my mom or like check in on my brothers to make sure they're doing okay. So checking in as much as possible yeah. um, and trying to be kind to myself because I can't do more and, but being okay with that and just knowing that what I can do is totally enough. Yeah, that's so good. Um, I want to get to a few questions from the viewers, but I, I have one. Yes. Your, I think I touched on this at the very beginning, but your vulnerability, your honesty has always stood out to me. And I know that is the scariest thing in the world to so many people. The idea of being super open, especially about difficult things. And I wonder, I imagine people ask you for advice, but I wonder, has that been a process for you? Has it gotten easier over time? And for someone on the other end of the spectrum where they can't imagine, or they're, or they're trying to begin imagining talking about their mental health or struggles or abuse or things that have happened, I wonder what advice you might have for someone. What I've learned for myself is that being vulnerable is, is a strength. Um, I think oftentimes it's viewed as a weakness if you're sensitive or if you're super vulnerable, but I, I've learned that it's actually my superpower um, and I'm so grateful for it. And the power of poetry or the power of just writing out what you're going through, and it doesn't have to be for an audience. I think it should always be for yourself first is the sure. first step of like recognizing your vulnerability. And I, the, the, what got me into poetry was talking about my, my experience with abuse and knowing that like, as soon as I shared my poem, there were other people who could relate and, and found a connection in that. And that was like my, my plug, my, my everything. And that's my best advice. Like just, you know, it doesn't have to be for anyone. It's for you. And also knowing that it's okay to be vulnerable. It makes you human and it makes you beautiful. And what we go through is a part of our story. And, and, and it's never just for ourselves. It's always for like someone else who's going through it too. And like, that is all I need to get through anything, you know? Yeah. No, that's so good. Well, is it cool to take a, a couple questions from these folks? Totally cool. All right. Tanya, do you have to deal with people not acknowledging your illness? And if so, how do you do that? Yes, <laughs> I do have to deal with people. Um, the thing with my uh, with lupus is that it can be perceived as an invisible illness. So I may not appear sick, you know, um, but but I am. I am quite sick. And so what I've learned is to be patient with people because they just don't have the knowledge. Like I didn't know what lupus was before I was diagnosed and I've learned so much by going through it. And so I'm, I'm learning how to not, not attack that person, but to understand where they're coming from and then give them the knowledge as to like how I'm living. And, and that's been the best like solution for that. I find. Yeah. That sounds like a very grace-filled answer, like a very <laughs> kind answer. Yeah, some days are harder than others. There are other days where I am upset and, um, and I have to allow myself to be upset, but then, then I'm able to go forward. Yeah, oh, thank you for that. Um, this is a good one. Your best self-care tips for folks with chronic illnesses. Yes, get as much rest as possible, like rest, has been my favorite self-care tip and, and rest can look like so many different things, sleeping in or just staying in whatever, staying in bed. But our bodies are like 
on the front lines of whatever chronic illness we're fighting. And so it's so important that we take care of this, this vessel, this house. And when we do, we we're also taking care of our mental health in that regard. And so whatever that looks like, drinking water, you know, um, rest or what, what we eat, you know, what we watch, what we, and all of those things. And I'm learning every day. So I, like, <laughs> I'm finding yeah. that like, being in the sun while I can't be in the sun for too long because that does trigger my lupus I know that okay if I'm in the sun for about 10 minutes that's good enough for me and then I get to the shade so you have yeah, to work yeah. with your body listening to your body is the best self-care tip for yeah. fun burns. Um, mine is up is not related to chronic illnesses but I think I that's something I love about self-care is just the idea that it can look different for all of us I don't know if it's a silly example but I sometimes talk about how you and I might walk up to a buffet mm -hmm. at a restaurant and we'll come back with different things on our plate. But, but to me, it's like, it's, it's just the idea that our self care might look totally different and that's fine. What's important is that we have stuff that works for us. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, what was I going to ask you? Oh, does it ever, same question I asked Kate, I wonder when you choose to be vulnerable, I imagine that invites people who have very vulnerable responses. Yeah. Um, when you talk openly about your mental health or painful things that have happened, what is it like navigating the responses from people who read your books or see you at an event or watch a video of yours? Um, that's a great question. I've, it's been a combination of like a heaviness, but like a good heaviness because I'm grateful that I'm able to share my story so that others feel comfortable sharing theirs. Um, and, and sometimes I, I feel like I feel kind of helpless because all I, I don't know, I want to fix it. You know, I want to fix their problem. I want to provide a solution, but I also am aware that them just sharing it with me is like, is like such a gift, you know? And so I, I never take it for granted. Um, and I listen, I listen because I, I know when I, when I'm in that space, all I want is just someone to listen to me and why I even came to poetry was, was for that reason. I just wanted to be heard from all of the silence prior. And, and I just want to provide that safe space for people. And so I'm very like thankful. Like it, I, it blows my mind every time someone like shares their part, a part of their story, whether it be something really hard to share or just like, thank you for sharing that poem. I'm, I'm beyond, beyond grateful. Yeah, I love that. So we're gonna get cut off here in a minute. Would you be cool with, are you open to doing a poem or two? Yeah, I would love to. Okay, so how about I'll end this one and then I'll jump right back on and we'll have you back on and then we'll get to a couple poems of yours. That's awesome. All right, yeah. so everyone, I'm gonna close out and come right back. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you. All right, we are back. We're gonna bring Tanya Ingram right back. Thank you guys for your patience as we navigate technical issues. I'm gonna see if we can get Tanya right back on. Let's see. Okay. So we're adding Tanya. Thank you guys for coming back. Hey. 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 <laughs> um, and uh, it's working better. That's it a cool, is. that's a cool water bottle. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, we would, we would love to uh, to hear from you if that's okay. If you don't mind yes. sharing, I don't your mind gift sharing at all. I will preference this by saying some of these poems were written pre like social distancing, sure. so there may be some lines that are like hang out, but like we can't do that. So please yeah, just yeah, ignore yeah. those lines. Um, okay, I'm gonna share two poems. Um, the first one is called "Dear Discouraged," which I wrote actually with with y'all um, a few years back, um, and okay. Here we go. With all that is real and difficult in this life, with the news, the death, 
the sighs that fill our conversations. I want to urge the value in taking care of ourselves, in taking care of each other. So please, post that selfie if it means we can find something beautiful in the ruin. Allow yourself to be angry. Go to McDonald's and yes, devour those fries without shame, dab until your arm is exhausted. Sit by the ocean. If you're anything like me, learn how to ride a bike. Weep in the bathroom. Weep on the train. Weep in the arms of someone who gets it. Go to a store and try on anything that you cannot afford right now, but treat yourself to the idea of embracing what seems impossible. Be in love. Be in love, be in love, be in love, be in love with yourself. Always first, support your friends. Read a romance novel, write 16 bars, watch a nonsensical amount of cat videos, buy a stranger a meal. You've got hugs, give them out for free. Stay in bed, damn it, dance like everyone is watching. Dance like everything is lit, holy dust, you are here. The world may be slipping from your grasp, but you've got a storm of goodness behind you. I would be lying if I said it was easy. If I said our trauma isn't something that we need to check on regularly. If I said joy isn't a full-time occupation, yes, I hear you. This is not a means of ignoring what is reality, no. This is living despite it all. This is a gospel of sorts, you, something more than a miracle. Us turning love into rebirth. Mm. That's that poem. Awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. Would you want to do another one? Yeah, I'm going to do one more. And this poem okay. isn't actually in my, uh, in How to Survive Today. And uh, I wrote it. Oh, my gosh, that was a bug. Sorry. Um, I wrote okay. it with um, the, the intention of mine of, like, what, what does it mean to be strong right now mm -hmm. and just in general. And I feel like people, or at least myself, like, I don't know what it is to be strong right now. And I'm kind of allowing myself to, to feel that and be in that space. So this is How to Be Strong how to be strong don't be a hot mess an ugly cry in the emergency room the third rejection letter this week ruin your makeup while weeping over the overdue phone bill download that dating app immediately after the ex you met on it leaves you Borrow a shoulder to lean on and a Spotify playlist to lose your voice to. Find a bubble bath after dialysis. Find a cute dog after an anxiety attack. Find your name after you were called out of it. Write a love poem to the day you could not get out of bed. Be bold about your fears, about the diagnosis, about the day you thought you would not make it. Strength is an occupation a marigold in dust, a thing we cannot see when the world is ending, but a reminder we keep when we survive long enough to see that it has not. That's that. <laughs> awesome. <Yeah. coughs> hey, will you, how can people support you? How can they read your work? Obviously we're gonna encourage people to follow you, but what else can people do? Um, I have a website now. So tanyaingram.com uh, is where you can find like where I'm doing anything. Um, and my book is available in my bio and my like Instagram, but it's we're also selling it through bookshop.com um, to support small businesses and local bookstores. And so yeah, that's the best way. I think I spend the most time on Instagram. So that's probably like my best my best place. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you are awesome. Um, thank, thank you for spending this time. I'm glad we, we, we figured it out. We got it to work. We did. You thank you for your patience as oh, well. Oh, totally. <laughs> you, you figured it out. Well, um, I'll let you go, but it's so good to catch up and um, enjoy that sunshine, sunshine while you're outside. For sure. I'm sending y'all all of the sun as well. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, thanks, yeah. Tanya. Thank you, Jamie. You take right, care. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye. So as, as she mentioned, please visit her website, follow her on Instagram if you don't already. She is, her name is Tanya Ingram. Uh, her newest book is How to Survive Today. 
uh, tanyaingram.com. So she is wonderful. We are proud and glad to know her. And I just want to run back through some, some announcements before I let you go. We dropped a new podcast today. It's a conversation with our friend Chris Hewitts. It's called Making Room for Grief, Gratitude, and Mindfulness. You can find that on the Fear Won't Win landing page that we've created that we keep updating. We love Chris. He's brilliant. He is an Enneagram guru if you are a fan of the Enneagram. So again, you can find that on our website this Thursday. So two days from now, April 30th, 4 p.m. Eastern, we will be hosting another Twiloha at home, but this is a special one hosted by Chad and Elizabeth from our team. It is going to be an alcohol-free virtual happy hour. And that will be with Jesse Hawkins from the Mocktail Project. And he will be teaching you to make a pina canada. You can find the ingredients on the events page on our website. So it's waloha.com, uh, twaloha.com slash events, I believe. And if you want to make a drink along with Jesse, you can find the ingredients there and come prepared. If you just wanna watch and take in a conversation about sobriety, you're welcome to, that's Gracie. <laughs> um, let's see. And then someone asked, will we be doing this again? We're doing it every Tuesday and Thursday throughout this season of <laughs> Gracie's little face. <laughs> Tuesday and Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern. We are going to keep showing up for you. I get to do a lot of these, but we love when you get to meet other people from our team as well. So that's the plan. Uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. We will be launching another black and white merch collection. <laughs> I can't get over Gracie. <laughs> Black and white merch collection. Uh, we will be dropping it the day before. So Thursday, April 30th, there will also be new blog posts, uh, new podcast episodes. Let's see. And then Giving Tuesday now, which is something new. One week from today, May 5th, we are inviting people. We are being honest that we need your support to continue to do what we do, to continue to bring encouragement, hope, resources, to people to continue to connect. <laughs> this little dog, crazy. Oh my gosh. Uh, we want to continue to connect. <laughs> Can you just do it? <laughs> oh my gosh. Little puppy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Side note. Animals are wonderful. Her little ear is tucked back. Okay, you guys. <laughs> oh, I'm talking about important stuff here. But she... <laughs> we want to keep doing what we do. It's been 14 years. I'm crying laughing. We want to keep bringing hope, encouragement, resources. My mom, my mom just asked if Gracie is looking for grandma. Oh my gosh, that was so cute. We want to keep funding treatment. We want to keep helping people remove the financial barriers that prevent them from getting help. You guys are laughing. I really appreciate that. Not very professional. Mom, we're doing our best. Everyone is doing their best. She's just walking around on the couch, you know? Anyway, Giving Tuesday now, one week from today. May 5th, Tuesday, May 5th. Uh, if you want to learn more, if you want to con consider donating or making a one-time gift, it's twaloha.com slash donate. We are grateful to be able to do this work. We're going to keep showing up for you. Um, yeah, again, for me, it's a privilege to be here on behalf of our team, on behalf of our staff, our interns. I also want to give a shout out to our friend Anis Mojgani who yesterday was named the 10th Poet Laureate for the state of Oregon. I don't even fully understand what that means, but I know it's a big deal. So Anis Moshgani, Poet Laureate for the state of Oregon, I believe named by the governor. We love Anis, he is another talented, incredible poet that we're proud to call a friend. So Anis, congrats. Uh, you're invited to our website, Learn more, check out the Fear Won't Win. Sorry. And, uh,
uh, yeah, we're going to keep showing up for as long as we're in this difficult season. So thank you guys for your support. Thanks for following along. Thanks for watching and listening today. Uh, we love you and we will see you Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern. Stay healthy, stay safe one day at a time. We're going to get through this.